This award is more personal. It's considered a prize by IRS standards. It honors a person's efforts and achievements, and this individual may use these funds as he or she sees fit. Maybe a vacation would be in order. Uh, the Kirkpatrick Medallion, uh, the Kirkpatrick Honor Medallion. Oh, I forgot that. Could somebody bring that to me? We've been working on this for equally as long. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Uh, the Kirkpatrick Honor Medallion has been designed by internationally acclaimed artist Jonathan Bronson, who's here with us today from Utah. Thank you. Jonathan is a, a sculptor whose work is featured in the White House, the Capitol and Senate offices, Windsor Castle, and in private collections in more than 120 countries. He's, wor he's worked in wildlife conservation for many years alongside champions such as Prince Philip, the fourth Baron uh, Rothschild, and, and many more. He has a wonderful bio, and it's also in your program. Uh, he's here today with his wife, Leanne, who's also been a big part of making this medallion come to life. I'm gonna hand this to Chris. The, medall the medallion features Eleanor and John Kirkpatrick on one side and on the reverse side, an American bison, which is Oklahoma's, as you know, official state animal and a lasting symbol of successful wildlife conservation. The neck ribbon is made from the Kirkpatrick tartan and the Scottish phrase, I mock Sikar is presented uh, throughout genealogical uh, Kirkpatrick genealogical history, and it means I make sure, I make sure. Jonathan took a traditional approach to crafting the medallion, spending months studying the profiles of Eleanor and John and sculpting their portraits by hand. And he says that artists today, you, today use machines to engrave coins and medallions, and we decided instead to do it by hand in the classical tradition used since Greek and Roman times to give it a personal touch. It was important with this piece to take time to recognize those who do incredible work, set an example, and inspire others to follow in their footsteps. Thank you, Jonathan, for making this for us today. So uh, here are the game rules. Um, after I announce the winner of the Kirkpatrick Prize, we'll watch an eight-minute video so you can have a deeper understanding and appreciation for the work that her organization does in the lives of animals and then I'll ask her to join me on stage. It's my pleasure to announce the first winner of the Kirkpatrick Honor for Animal Wellbeing, Natalie Cross. <laughs> sure. Now, you know the waterworks. Um, Natalie is the founder of Blaze's Tribute Equine Rescue Center. And let's take a quick moment to take a look at this video. Okay, now Natalie, you're gonna go play with it. <laughs> Dog to death, they're, they're, just, uh, they're just dying slowly. Their bones showing through and hooves cracked. These horses are the lucky ones. It's hard to watch. Get thinner and thinner and ribs showing. Deputies say that it was a tip from a neighbor that brought them here to this property, but when they began searching around, they were shocked by what they found. And we found between 20 and 30 carcasses and varying degrees of decay. Deputies estimate the vet bills to get the animals to full health will cost at least $10,000. A group called Blazes Tribute from Jones, Oklahoma is taking custody of the horses. They will be up for adoption when they are medically cleared. We were catching horses with water at the last seizure. They were so thirsty and had been without water for so long that we were filling buckets where, you know, sometimes you put feed in your bucket to catch the horses. We were putting water in the buckets to catch the horses. And they were drinking that water so fast we couldn't fill the buckets soon, quick enough. It was that des they were that desperate for water. Sometimes we're digging with shovels, digging manure and mud out away from the doors so we can open doors and get into stalls and get these horses, these animals out of these barns that they've been stuck in for so long. It's just, it's, it's hard. You just have to, to 
to stay focused and and some people can't do it some people show up and they realize this is too much i can't have, i can't see this i can't go in there i'll i'll drive the truck some people will do that just drive the truck load them in my trailer i'll drive the truck get them where they need to go and then you guys can unload them i'm not sure i could do what they do uh with everything that they see and and everything they've got to go through uh and thank you is not enough uh, for what they do. I have PTSD, okay? And because of their calming effect, when my PTSD starts acting up and whatnot, and I start feeling all that, I can walk out in the middle of the pasture, and it's almost like they sense it, and they'll just come around and sit here and do this right here, and just sit here and just pet them and love on them, and it has a very calming effect. When you pull into that, that very first place and you see walking skeletons and you see horses starved and neglected at all different levels it's it's very emotional i mean I, i'd have to say that it was very hard um but i quickly learned that you can't take that time to grieve and and you know ask why i just decided we have to do what we have to do to to get those horses back on track it was very overwhelming <laughs> we did it by the grace of god we've We've evolved a lot in 13 years. I pretty much have dedicated my life to this, so I homeschool my kids, you know, and we, we take care of everything behind the scenes. My husband works a full-time job in order to support the Cross family, um, and then when he comes home, he goes back to work for, for, for Blazes. So it's definitely, it's a full-time job, and it takes every one of us, you know, from, from our kids to our board members to, to everybody. Our board members and volunteers help us with trucks and trailers, and we go to on location to, you know, to pick up the horses. So we'll catch them all up, load them up, and then bring them back here. Um, at that point, we immediately have our veterinarian come in and, uh, and do a physical examination and assess all the horses. We bring our farrier in to you know, trim their feet. Uh, the Department of Agriculture will come in and pull blood work in order to test for Coggins to make sure that you know, they're all negative Coggins. And then from that point on, we just you know, establish a rehabilitation plan and a schedule for each individual horse and start bringing them back to health. It's not just feeding them. <laughs> I did a lot of volunteer work with the Oklahoma City Animal Welfare Division. I helped a lot with the dogs and the cats, and I didn't realize that they took in horses. We got a new shelter manager, and I asked her, what, what did you do with the horses? And she said, after the cruelty cases are closed, we usually send them to the for sale livestock auction. You know, most of the, the auctions are frequented by steel buyers, and they're sending them and shipping them overseas for slaughter. So I thought, you know, we're taking them from one bad situation and ultimately putting them in the, in the frying pan, so to speak. So she said they had no other outlet for their horses. And I just looked at her and said, you do now. And from that moment on, I decided I was going to rescue horses. I never dreamed it would be to the magnitude that it is today. <laughs> the tractor trailer wreck, it was something totally different than what we normally deal with. You know, we normally deal with neglect cases. Um, but when you see horses that was really destined to be on somebody's dinner plate, it brings a whole different aspect to what you just did. The kill buyer lived in Missouri, so once the uh, truck overturned, he had a trailer come and get them, and they hauled them back to Missouri. So we had to, you know, work with them to to allow them to let us have the horses and bring them back to Oklahoma. And I I remember watching them pull into the driveway, and all of the horses was just kind of staring out the window, and you could see in their eyes, it's like they knew immediately when they pulled in that they had a new beginning. So I think that was the one that tore me up the most because they weren't meant to be here. I wasn't gonna do this. <laughs> they wasn't supposed to be here. If that tractor trailer hadn't overturned, those horses would be dead. So looking at them, looking out that trailer window and seeing, you could just tell that they, they knew that their life had changed. Everybody said that horses that go to slaughter were no good or you know they had no value to life anymore and each one of those horses had a full value of life it's sad to think that we slaughter these guys for a foreign industry you know we don't eat horses so why do we ship them over there to slaughter them so they just they deserve us you know they just i think they deserve a second chance The mission is just to help them get better, fat, find their forever homes where they'll be loved forever. They're just laying flat like they were dead because it was in the middle of 
August or June, so maybe it's really hot for these guys. And she just comes out here and she thinks she's a horse now. <laughs> I guess it's their beauty. They're just magnificent. They don't really... I don't know, I guess they're just... a mystery. Makes me feel a little blessed that I get to be a part of it and just watch them turn into different kinds of horses, the horses they were meant to be. I'm just seeing what he knows going over this, going over logs, seeing how he's going to follow me. A horse wants a leader. They're a herd animal, so they want a leader. Probably needs more weight, more rides, and can be a great horse. And nowadays, we just, you know, we can get a horse, we want to be a world champion the next day. We don't want to put the, put the time in it. And that's all these guys need, the time. It's a hard job. You know, we're, we see the worst. There's a lot of battles with these guys we can't win. And, but when you can adopt that horse off into its family and you can see all the updates and they come to our trail rides and they, those horses are part of their family, there's where it's restored. Medically, we're prepared to treat them. I think emotionally, you have to prepare yourself for the things you see here. There have been a lot of times when you think, gosh, we did all that and it's you couldn't save them. And so it's trying. Those days are trying and, and we've definitely shed some tears and talked about it, but then we just have to regroup and refocus and make a difference in the other horses' lives. It's a team. It's a, it's a family, so to speak. And um, it, I, I can only imagine what she felt like when she was getting interviewed for that. <laughs> but it was important to us that we had somebody that was gonna be just as much involved as we was. I know I've touched many horses' lives. I'd like to think of somewhere at the end of the day I touched many people's lives too. You are not obliged to say anything, but I'm obliged to give you this medal, and if you will allow me to do so. Thank you. Will you please join me in welcoming Thank you. I don't even know what to say. Um, what a blessing to think back. So many years ago, Kirkpatrick Foundation was the first um, organization to give us our first grant to get us where we have been able to do so much more today. Um, I'm truly blessed. I couldn't do this without my wonderful group of people over there. They have made Blazes what Blazes is today. And my husband and my family and my board members, they give up so much. And uh, I know that there's so much out there that they would like to be doing, but they, they stick to me and help us so much. So I can't thank you guys enough for all that you've done. and. Um, Thanks to Greg Malott for that wonderful video. That was amazing. And thanks to you for everything that you've done and supported us through over the years. I, I don't even, I can't thank you enough. <laughs>